Welcome to the EQ Fit Podcast. Our mission is to equip people to prosper in every aspect of their life. Whether you're at home or in the workplace, we explore practical ways of improving success, satisfaction, finding balance, and building enjoyable and beneficial relationships. Thank you for joining us. We're continuing our series on leading with emotional intelligence, and the focus this time is going to be self-regulation. And I'm going to define that in a little bit, but I want to start with just kind of an overview, and then I want to share a story. I like to share these true stories with you because it's in these stories that we see this lived out, the actual application of where are the gaps, where are the weaknesses, where is the behavior that needs to change and be transformed, and then what is that journey and what is that process, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. So leading with emotional intelligence focused on self-regulation, the whole concept of self-regulation, if you think about the ability to be more intentional, more often, more thoughtful, more considerate, more intentional with your choices, with your decisions, with your actions, with your communications. That's kind of a high level definition of self-regulation. Now, leaders who can do that or leaders who are growing in that competency of self-regulation can actually optimize their impact. We're going to go deeper into the specific emotional intelligence skills that that are integrated into this competency, and we're going to talk about some very practical strategies for growing those skills and growing this competency of self-regulation. Really, when it comes down to it, if you want to be an effective leader, You've got to understand leadership is not just about what you're thinking and what you're feeling and your perspectives. Leadership is actually more about what other people are thinking, what other people are feeling, what other people's perspectives are. And here's the key. How do you engage them to do the things that you want them to do move in the direction that you want them to go, make the decisions that you know are better and right decisions, take the actions that you know will get the results that you know you need. That's leadership. But leadership is about getting things done through other people, not just telling other people what to do. Because in most cases, leaders assume that the people they talk to know what they're supposed to do. If they say, do this, the leader expects that person to know what to do. And most of the time they don't know. They don't know what to do. They don't know how to do it. They don't know what the expectations are. Now, it doesn't matter where the fault is. It always comes back to the leader. So let me start by sharing a story with you. In my work with leaders within organizations, Nothing is more difficult to help them change in themselves than what I call impulsive behavior. This is a form of sabotage. Sabotage is a counterproductive habit that limits a leader's impact and it creates some really bad things. It creates uncertainty. It creates toxicity. And in some cases, it can even create a hostile work environment. Now, I want you to take the example of a leader I know who's going through things in their life that seems to have really changed their entire approach to life and work. Their behavior patterns have changed significantly. Now, without going deep into the psychology of what's behind this behavioral change, The reality is that the way they're showing up today is very, very different than what they used to show up as to their employees. 
and this has created the uncertainty and the toxicity that I mentioned a minute ago. So how would you know? You know, I see this all the time. I work in many different organizations, hundreds of organizations over all the years I've done this, thousands of different people. So I have this large experience base to pull from. But how would you know if you see someone who is acting impulsively? I mean, you kind of know that common sense wise, right? But it gets magnified in a leadership focus. So how does this person's behavior manifest right now? Well, in short, impulsive actions with little thought as to how they're showing up for other people. Let's break that down because I want to make this really, really clear. If some of this hits home with you, then just use that as a learning opportunity that your self-awareness is kicking in saying, hey, maybe there's something in this for me and don't judge yourself. Everything I'm talking about here has no judgment in it. It's simply how do we get better at what we do? How do we become better leaders? And again, I believe everybody's a leader because we lead ourselves first. So what are the behaviors that you might see? Uh, and, and I'm going to tell you in this person, this is what I'm seeing right now. Helicopter application of their efforts. Constantly hovering and choosing random times to land the helicopter and jump in. Another behavior I'm seeing is a noticeable lack of energy. So much energy is going to dealing with all their internal stuff that there isn't a lot of energy left for other things, for external efforts. Here's another behavior. And this is one that is very concerning to me. And I'm seeing it more and more in organizations at all levels. It's what I call continuous partial attention. It's a state of only being partially attentive or partially present in everything a person does. So it's the person that when you sit down in a meeting, you know, maybe they share something, but immediately they jump on their phone and look at their email or they look at something else. Or you're having lunch with someone and and they're busy texting or they're busy doing something else or you know, the focus isn't there. This continuous partial attention, if we could put a number to that, I think the loss to organizations annually would be in the multiple billions of dollars. It's it's a lowering of the work ethic. It's a lowering of the standards of quality of work. And I'm not saying everybody does this, and we probably all do it at some point in our lives, but it's the continuous partial attention that is a real problem. Here's another behavior that I've seen in this leader, a stated desire to please other people. So this leader is saying, I feel like I have to please everybody, but it's coming from a place of self-interest or self-focus where everything that they do is about getting what they want out of things. I know that sounds counterintuitive, but I have seen this many times over the years with leaders who are in this place of, of and I'm just going to call it what it is, it's a lack of self-regulation. It's a lack of self-awareness. And we covered self-awareness in our last episode. And the last one I'll share with you is that people in the organization are actively avoiding this individual. That's a big red flag. If you see people actively avoiding a leader, that could be some of what's going on there. Now, you may have seen this in a leader that you know, and maybe you see one or two of these things in yourself, and that's okay. Because if you see it and realize it, you're halfway to fixing it. Uh, It's the people that don't realize it, that don't have the self-awareness that get stuck in this negative cycle. Uh, This type of behavior is a true lack of self-regulation. In my work with leaders who are experiencing this, we start by going back to self-awareness. 
without self-awareness, there can be no real effective development of self-regulation. The light bulb has to come on for a leader to enter into a transformative process to enhance their leadership impact, to enhance their self-regulation. Now, this starts with enhanced self-awareness, then acceptance of the reality, then commitment to change, then effort to do the work that's needed to transform their leadership. That is the sequence. It is the journey to move people from the place of sabotage, the place of these counterproductive habits and behaviors, into a much better, more effective place as a leader. In all the years I've been working with leaders to help them grow and develop their leadership skills, this is one of the most rewarding experiences for everyone involved. When they see the light, when the leader sees the light and makes the effort to make that transformation, it is truly a wonderful experience for everyone. Okay, let's get into the specifics now. What is self-regulation? It refers to the ability to manage your own emotions, your behaviors, and your impulses effectively. Maintaining control and staying composed under pressure. It involves being mindful of your emotional responses and making deliberate choices about how to express them. I could say that phrase over and over again, and I could never emphasize it enough. It is how you use that emotional energy. That is, whether you're going to be self-regulating at a high level or not. If you are self-regulating, if your self-regulation is higher, it's more about responding rather than reacting. Think of knee-jerk reaction versus a thoughtful response. That's a good way I keep in my mind how to keep those things clear and what are they, is reacting is just almost immediate and it usually has some regret to it later, whereas responding is a more thoughtful approach where you think through the options, think through the consequences, and then you pick the right one, the one that comes out best for everyone. Self-regulation, when you're responding, ensures that your actions are aligned with your long-term goals and values. I cannot tell you how many people I've seen over the years who have torpedoed their own long-term goals, even their values, the way that they want to live their life and their standards by not being at a level of self-regulation that they need to be in a specific situation. I have seen people lose their jobs at high levels over a moment of a lack of self-regulation. And I'm not saying that's a daily thing for people, but it, this is important stuff. It directly impacts so many different things. So let's talk about the value and the benefits of developing self-regulation as a competency in leadership. Number one, enhanced decision-making. Leaders that have strong self-regulation skills are better equipped to make thoughtful and informed decisions, and they can manage their emotions and consider the consequences of their actions even under high stress and high pressure. That's a huge benefit to developing this this self-regulation competency. Improved relationships is the next one. By navigating emotions constructively and demonstrating empathy, leaders can build stronger, more trusting relationships. And trust there, that word trust is so critical to leaders. Trust is the currency of getting things done. And if you have to get things done through other people, you've got to have trust. Because connection plus trust equals influence. That's an equation I use all the time. If you have good connections with people, good relationships, 
and you built up high levels of trust, you will have more influence you can spend. So navigating emotions here and practicing empathy will help you do those things. Here's another one, increased resilience. Self-regulated leaders are more resilient in the face of challenges and setbacks. And that's a big one. It isn't just the challenges. What happens when things go wrong? What happens when there's a big mistake? How do you deal with that? Unfortunately, a large part of the population shuts down or backs off or hides or avoids dealing with it when there is a setback. And they stay in that cycle until the pain of staying in that negative place is so great that they feel like they have to change. Well, what if you were resilient enough to go, okay, it's like a bad shot in golf. When I go out and play golf, I have a bad shot. I have a choice. Am I going to carry that bad shot and what's in my mind about it into the next shot and the next hole and the rest of that round? Or am I going to leave it and move on? Am I going to learn from it and move on? So think about that when you think about how important resilience is. Here's another consistent value when it comes to uh, leadership and it comes to this this competency of self-regulation. It's the ability to create consistent leadership. Leaders who manage their emotions effectively are seen as stable and reliable. Now, we all have this concept of what leaders ought to be, and and it's very different for different people. But please let me share this with you. Most employees are going to have a high S, high C, meaning a, a steadiness or a compliance mindset when it comes to the people that actually get things done in organizations and work at that entry level and, and next level up. So high S, high C people want a steady, reliable workplace. Trust is built on steady and reliable. You may want to be charismatic and you may want to be all those things as a leader and go ahead and do it. Good for you, but don't do it at the expense of a stable and reliable environment because that's where people feel comfortable and they can thrive. And that's how we help people grow in their own professional uh, excellence, their own professional skills, so they can become leaders someday. So this stable, reliable workplace, it actually enhances a leader's credibility and their influence within the organization because you're seen as somebody that can navigate the storms well and keep an even keel and even direction. You're headed the right way. You're keeping people rowing in the same direction. So that there's a lot to be said for this consistent leadership. And then alignment with values. Pursuing noble goals, which is a specific emotional intelligence competency, which helps align actions with personal and organizational values. It ensures that leaders act with integrity So it's keeping that high standard, that high work ethic. It also fosters a culture of trust and a culture of ethical behavior. Isn't that a place you want to work? I know it's a place I want to work. I want to work for organizations that have that kind of culture. That's where it gets fun because there isn't all this mess to clean up, forgive the term, but you can start from a place that's already positive and you can grow things from there. That's a great place to be. Now, let me break this down. I told you I was going to give you the specific emotional intelligence skills that directly relate to this competency of self-regulation. And there are several of them. And again, I'm pulling from the six seconds model of emotional intelligence And I'm going to list out those specific emotional intelligence skills that are actually fairly easy to learn and grow in uh, and how they directly relate to this area of self-regulation. Emotional literacy. 
which recognizes and understands the emotions themselves, both in yourself and other people. Recognizing patterns, identifying habitual emotional reactions and behavior. So those two are a big part of self-awareness. Can I define what my emotion is or my complex set of emotions that I'm having? Do I know how they impact me? Do I know how they impact other people? And can I recognize the patterns that I have or the habits that I have? And when I get in a specific scenario, how I tend to react in that scenario. If you have high levels of those two skills, then you have high levels of self-awareness. And that is a huge benefit when it comes to self-regulation because self-regulation cannot happen very well without a fairly high level of self-awareness. Otherwise, you're just shooting in the dark. You just literally are just hoping you do the right things. And often you end up reacting more than responding, which we know for self-regulation is not a good position to be in. So the next one is apply consequential thinking, considering the outcomes of your actions and coming up with options. Think through things before you make decisions, before you take actions. That is at the heart of responding versus reacting. And then navigating emotions, and this is a big one. That is Can you manage your emotional responses constructively? Can you repurpose the energy and information you're getting from an emotion into a more strategic outcome? That navigating emotions is is a big deal. And right now, I'm seeing a lot of people with low navigating emotion scores on their EQ test. And when I see that, we have some work to do. The The good part about that is I know exactly how to help them. If they're willing to put in the effort, I know how to help them grow that navigating emotion skill. And when it comes to self-regulation, that's huge. Because if you cannot navigate your own emotions, forget about self-regulation. You're just going to be expressing things in ways that are not helpful. So you're not really being self-regulating. Next one is intrinsic motivation staying driven by internal values and goals. External motivators are unreliable. Money, status, fame, appreciation, all of that, those are very unreliable. Internal motivators, however, are something you can count on. Do you have a good internal battery fueled by your values, your beliefs, what's important to you? If the answer to that is yes, you're a long way toward having the energy that you need to practice self-regulation at a high level. Then you have intrinsic motivation, which I've covered intrinsic motivation. We'll move on. Then you have optimism, maintaining a positive outlook despite challenges. Optimism is really looking to the future with hope and possibility. And it's not false optimism. It's not fake it till you make it. It's not any of that. It is truly choosing to be optimistic and to practice optimism. That's why they call it exercise optimism in the six second skill set of emotional intelligence skills because you choose to exercise it and grow it and build it up. Then empathy, and this of course is huge. Understanding other people's emotions and perspectives and taking those into account, you do that by listening effectively, being an active listener where you're really fully present for that other person. And you don't have to agree with everything somebody else says or thinks or feels, but empathy is at least taking it into account. And in the connection that you have with that person. It's, it's increasing that empathy so that they can see that you really do care. And then you make the best decisions you can as a leader from that place. So the last one we'll talk about as a specific skill of emotional intelligence related to self-regulation is pursuing noble goals 
which is aligning your actions with your personal values and goals, but also with organizational values and goals. That's critical because how can you lead well? How can you self-regulate without aligning all of that to the desired outcomes? So next, I want to dive deeper into how do we actually develop these things? How do we develop a stronger competency in self-regulation? Okay. Enhancing self-regulation is a continuous process, and I want to stress that. It's not going to change overnight, okay? It didn't get this way overnight, right? So it isn't going to change overnight. But it's a continuous process that involves a conscious effort and a conscious practice. Here are some very practical ways to develop this essential competency of self-regulation. I'm going to list these out and talk a little bit about each of them. The first one is mindfulness. And again, I I have people reach out to me, Steve, is that mindfulness stuff, that weird new age stuff? No, no, no. It's literally taking the time to reflect and think about different situations, different scenarios. Mindfulness is, is really about allowing your brain time to meditate on, through whatever technique you want. I don't care if it's scriptural meditation for those who have a faith walk or whether it is just deep meditation with music in the background or whether it is deep breathing exercises. Whatever works for you. Mindfulness is important. It's giving your brain the time to process, to assimilate to think through things, to work through things. Your brain is an amazing organism. I mean, it's just, it's an incredible creation that there isn't anything like it. Even artificial intelligence, I mean, the word artificial is in there for a reason, right? We have many different types of intelligence. We have IQ, rational intelligence. We have EQ, which is emotional intelligence. We have AQ, which is acquired intelligence. We have AQ, which is acquired intelligence. And we have TQ, which is technological intelligence. I mean, there's so many. And there's CQ, which is conversational intelligence. Our brains are just amazing things. But if you don't give your brain time to process, and I want to spend just a second and talk to everyone about this. There is such a misleading perception that if you're not busy every minute of the day, then you're not productive. And I'm going to come against that. And I'm going to come against it very strongly. That is, there is nowhere where that is the truth. The best way to help your brain operate at its highest level is to take little breaks throughout the day to just practice mindfulness, to let your brain rest, to assimilate. Your brain uses a lot of energy and it it takes a little time to restore that energy in the brain. Uh, I know when I'm doing creative things, that takes a lot of my energy. I know that at times I need to step away and maybe take 15 or 20 minutes for my brain to recharge and to be able to refocus and to process all of the things that that I'm thinking about. So practice mindfulness is so important. And when it comes to self-regulation, it's critical because the best leaders are ones that learn from every experience. Leaders are learners. I truly believe that phrase. What's the second way to grow this competency of self-regulation? And it's really a, it's kind of the mindfulness thing, but it's, it's in a more um, written format in some way, call it emotional journaling, where you maintain a journal of some kind to document experiences, to document triggers. I've got an easy to fill out uh, form that I've created for people that's called an emotional journal or an EQ, we call it the EQ Fit Journal 
which is literally what was the situation, what happened, what were you thinking, what were you feeling, what would you decide to do, what did you decide to do, what were the actions that you took, and if you could go back and change something, what would you change? If you do that for important things that happen or situations that maybe didn't go the way you wanted them to, if you do that consistently, you're going to be able to identify patterns. You're going to have the fuel you need to grow in your self-awareness and your self-regulation. So I know a lot of people look at journaling and say, oh my gosh, I'm not going to do that. That's stupid. I hate that. That's dumb. Okay, fine. But you do it at your own cost. You write that off at your own cost. I was never a journaler until I started. (laughs) And then I realized, and I don't do it all the time, but when I have significant things happen, I go to that form, I fill it out, and it makes a huge difference. Because it makes a huge difference in a variety of ways. Number one, I can release it by putting it down on paper or putting it down digitally. That's a big deal. That, that is a very good psychological approach to releasing things that you're struggling with or situations that didn't go the way you wanted them to. But you can also learn from those. Okay, where was the trigger in this for me? How did I react? How could I have responded better? What could I do to change my pattern or my habit here? It's hugely helpful, especially for leaders. And again, I do believe we're all leaders. The next thing is going to sound like common sense, but it's goal setting. Set clear, achievable goals that align with your values. What is this as far as self-regulation? Well, think of it this way. You're setting up the guardrails ahead of time so that you as a leader can run faster in your lane and not worry about going off into the ditch. That's what goal setting is for. Okay, I'm never going to act in this way. I am not going to allow myself to do X. Those are goals that you can set for your behavior that will keep you within the guardrails so that you can be more effective and have a higher leadership impact and get the results that you want to get. So the goal setting thing makes a lot of sense. Then consequential thinking. And we talked about applying consequential thinking a while ago. And that is before you react, take some time to consider the potential options and the potential outcomes of your actions. By doing this, you're going to make more thoughtful, more intentional decisions that lead to better actions and better outcomes. The next one is feedback and reflection. And these are just as important as all the rest. Ask for feedback and understand something. Feedback is a gift. If you ask somebody for feedback, especially if you're a leader and you're asking one of your employees, one of your team members, and they give you feedback and then you jump on them or you give some negative response to them, good luck getting honest feedback in the future. You just shot yourself in the foot. I would rather know what somebody is thinking and feeling. Now, maybe it's not completely accurate, but here's the deal. It is their perception and people's perceptions are their reality and it is where they make their decisions and take their actions from. So whether we like it or not and whether it's right or wrong doesn't matter. It is the environment they're living in. And we want feedback from people and we want open, honest feedback that gives us a good insight into how we're showing up for those people. That is self-awareness. And it, you don't have to like what other people are saying, but you ignore it at your own risk. And the last one I want to talk about is stress management. What kind of techniques can you use? 
Well, develop a toolkit of some kind for stress management, such as maybe it's take a walk, do some physical exercise, or maybe it's take some time, go do one of your hobbies. Focus on something else for a little bit. Practice some relaxation methods. Do something to take your mind and energy away from the work and the situation. And maybe it's during work days for just a few minutes, or maybe it's after work. But it's about balance. It's about finding that right balance so that you can have a balanced state of mind and a good emotional environment to work from. And here's a key for that. It's kind of an added bonus. If you've listened this long, thank you, because you're going to get a a surprise bonus package here. If your self-talk is more negative than positive, then you're out of balance. You need to figure out what's going on. I'm not talking about this whole positive speaking thing where you just speak positive phrases to yourself and magically you get better. That That's nonsense. But self-talk is profoundly powerful. If you find yourself judging yourself, criticizing yourself, and you find yourself talk negative, then you're out of balance. So figure out why. Where are the stressors? Where's the stuff that's sending you out of balance? Okay, to wrap this up, self-regulation is an absolute cornerstone of emotional intelligence that cannot be overlooked as a leader. If you can develop and strengthen this competency, you can enhance decision-making, you can build better relationships, you can increase your resilience, and you can maintain consistency in your decisions and your actions which is so critical to being seen and experienced as a good leader. Integrating those eight competencies from six seconds that we talked about is a comprehensive approach to cultivating self-regulation. Now, as you commit to this journey as a leader, not only will you improve your personal effectiveness, but you're going to contribute to the growth and success of your team and your organization. And by prioritizing self-regulation, you can truly lead with emotional intelligence and you can achieve a lasting and positive impact on your teams. Don't you want to be that leader that 20 years down the road, when one of your team members is asked, Tell me about the leader that most impacted your life in a positive way. Don't you want your name to come up in that conversation? I know I do. Thank you for joining us for this episode. If you have any questions about this week's episode or maybe a suggestion for future episodes you'd like us to explore, please contact us through our website at eqfit.org. For more information and inspiration, connect with us on LinkedIn, Facebook, and YouTube at EQFit.